Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Optimistic Future podcast. Today, I am joined by Anne Riggs. Anne runs a website called slavefreechocolate.org. Um, so as you can uh, deduce from the name of her website, um, she her website is all about promoting companies that produce chocolate um, that do not rely upon slave labor. Um, take a minute to let that digest for a second. Um, think of a lot of us, I know for me, um, 10 plus years ago would never have associated chocolate with slave labor. It's like, what is chocolate? It's, it's a wonderful thing. It's delicious. Something that we use to, you know, give our kids dessert to, you know, celebrate Valentine's day, you know, various things like that. Um, and, uh, about probably 10 years ago or so, it came across my, uh, or came, came to my awareness that, um, some, um, companies use, uh, raw materials to make chocolate that, um, unfortunately falls on the backs of, um, folks, driven into slave labor. And that's something when I heard about that, I was just appalled and said, okay, I'm not going to buy chocolate from companies that um, engage in that type of practice. Um, but uh, unfortunately, to my understanding, this is something that it does not have widespread awareness. Uh, folks are, I think if you pulled a hundred people or so at the grocery store on a random day, um, my guess would be that the vast majority are not aware of this um, being an issue. And so this is um, a topic that I think is really important to talk about because with the you know the underlying goal of the um, Optimistic Future podcast, where we uh, want to elucidate simple steps that we can all take to strive to make the world a better place, um, you know, in this case, um, making sure that we're buying chocolate if if we choose to buy chocolate you don't have to buy chocolate but if we're buying chocolate um buying it from a company that's not actually inflicting hardship on people in the world so it's kind of a simple step in that um it's not only working to you know um kind of proactively make the world a better place by say supporting companies that are uh, ethically sourcing uh resources to make their chocolate but also um at the same time mitigating basically wrongdoing in this world. Now, <clears throat> one of the personal reasons that I'm so happy to host this Optimistic Future podcast is that um, this is a topic that I think I know a fair bit about, but I'm excited to talk to Anne today to see, um, you know, what the real what the real story is. Um, it's not something that I've spent, um, you know, hours and hours and hours researching. She uh, she certainly has and has been running this website for quite a long time, to my understanding. So really excited to hear the story straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Um, and uh, I hope that this topic is going to be of interest and we'll we'll see what um, Anne has to say. So I'm just going to pause the recording and I will be joined by Anne in just a moment. Um, and just was thinking, I knew there was something that I didn't mention. And right. Oh, uh, as a reminder for anyone who has not already visited the Optimistic Future podcast website, um, on there I have a ongoing list of simple steps that we can all take to strive to make the world a better place. So if you have not visited the website, the URL is optimisticfuturepodcast.com. And there's a tab there that says simple steps. And you can click on that. If you want to put a little more elbow grease into some of these topics, then there is another tab for bigger steps. Uh, take a little more elbow grease but the simple steps are things that we can all incorporate um, quite seamlessly, quite effortlessly in many cases, uh, cost effectively in many cases, and worth taking a look at that list um, if you are so inclined. So now I will pause the recording and be back with Anne in just a moment. All right, everyone, I'm now joined by Anne Riggs. Anne, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Uh, so, Anne, would you mind telling our listeners just um, how you got involved with um, spreading awareness around slave-free chocolate, uh, how you started up your website, and yeah, just give us a little background about your organization and how you got involved. Okay, great. Um, we are basically, we are a group of grassroots activists. We don't take any money for what we're doing. Um, you know, sometimes people donate stuff and it kind of goes to pay for Wi-Fi or something like that. But, you know, we believe that we don't want to be part of the problem as being in the industry, as you know, the industry is I'm fighting slavery and I'm making money fighting slavery. To me, that's sort of like an, it can be like an ethical kind of like ethical problem. And there's enough people doing that. So I think it's important to have what we call extremely individual in extremely um, independent voices out there, too. That's not beholden to anything. I don't work in the food industry or chocolate industry, anything like that. I started Slave Free Chocolate about 2007. I was actually over in London and I randomly met a journalist from BBC, Humphrey Hoxley, who was working, who had just come back from Cote d'Ivoire or he was going to Cote d'Ivoire because the in England, they found out that our chocolate, industrial chocolate, is tied to the worst forms of child labor 
And what I mean by that is these kids are not going to school because their parents don't have the money to send them to school. They don't make enough money to enroll them in school or even get them to school because they're probably the nearest school is probably very, very far. So I randomly found out about this subject on my way back to the U.S. And I kept kept bothering me. I kept thinking, well, that's super weird. How could chocolate be tied to child slavery? That doesn't make any sense. So when I got back in 2007, whatever the search engine was, whether it was Yahoo did or whatever, go, you know, whatever I did, S Jeeves or something like that. And they found out that, yeah, it, it was true, but nobody knew about it. And what had happened was I found that Tulane University was hired as a watchdog for the Department of Labor to check on something called the Harkin Angle Protocol. And what the Harkin Angle Protocol was is in 2001, Elliot, Congressman Elliot Engel from the Bronx, so he's not tied to the food industry at all either, right, was reading the New York Times late one night, and he saw a really small article that child slavery is tied to our industrial chocolate. So that night, there was a big, huge um, ag bill that was going to hit the congressional floor, like one of those thousands of page things, and every politician has their this or that in it. And he put in there that a little legislation by 2005 Every single chocolate bar was going to have a stamp like um, Dolphin Save Tuna, but no savory here if such was the case. When that bill hit, the whole big bill passed, right? And when that bill hit the, before the bill hit the Senate floor, the industrial, the industrial chocolate industry, when I'm talking about industrial chocolate, I'm talking about the wholesalers, like Car the Cargill. Barry Calibo, Mandela's, these are brand companies that you eat from, but they sell to Hershey's, Nestle, Cadbury, all these smaller com companies where you hear the brands. Before it hit the Senate floor, they got wind of it. And they hired at the time the two most expensive lobbyists that Washington could buy, George Mitchell and Bob Dole, to thwart legislation. So they came up with a plan called the Harkin Angle Protocol, and they pulled in Tom Harkin. He's very, very tied to ag. When he was a senator, he was in Iowa. So all of his work is getting funded. All of his campaigns and everything is getting funded by Archer Daniel Middle Midlands and Cargill and such. And they came up with an idea. They put Harkin together with Engel, and they had a protocol, which was, we, under we understand that this is a problem. We know we're profiting on the worst forms of child labor and child's labor. We know about this, and we promise to remedy this situation. And we will, and basically though, the problem was it was not legislatively binding. They were going to police themselves. And so as you can imagine how that went, it went terribly. They didn't police themselves. They started a NGO called the World Chocolate Federation to sort of act as an umbrella for all these little projects that were going to clean up this mess. And they hired, the Department of Labor hired at that time Tulane Tulane University's Payson Center to write four watchdog reports. And I came in after the first watchdog report was issued in 2005, in which they basically got enough. You know, they started a little bit of a structure, World Chocolate Federation, but the numbers had not improved when it comes to these exploited children. In fact, they went up. The sec third, second report, same thing. Third report, same thing. Fourth report by 2010, I believe it was. Same thing, that contract was then sent to University of Chicago. They're still reporting that the dial of number of exploited children, whether they're children working for their parents and not going to school because there's no money to send them to school, or they're trafficked in from the two poorer countries of Burkina Faso and Mali, that dial is only going up. It's not going down. So, and here we are today, what, 17 years later? And so when I heard about all this, I thought, wow, this is a lot of information that nobody seems to know about because back in 2001, remember, it was all that 9-11 stuff and our wars with Iraq and all that kind of stuff. So there, there wasn't really any space for the media to focus on anything other than, you know, the 9-11 the stuff. So I thought, okay, well, why don't we just start a website and why don't we see what we could do? Maybe we can influence legislation. Maybe we can get enough people to understand that this is a problem. Um, and we, I started the website with my children, a bunch of Girl Scouts, a couple just kind of general activists. And, um, and at that time, it was in 2007, nobody was asking the question. Nobody was talking about ethical food. 
Nobody was talking about modern day slavery. If, if anybody mentioned trafficking or modern day slavery, it might have been through like sex, sex trafficking. But that was it. Nobody was talking about any laborers, children, anything like that. So what do you do when nobody's t trying to Google or ask a question on the Internet? Is my food ethical? Because nobody was doing that then. So we started out doing what we called like, oh, I call it like Brilla Awareness. You know, we would, I had my kids take popular songs and make these little YouTube videos, you know, outlining the problem, like a little PowerPoint that would go along with this music. We knew for copyright reasons, we were going to get kicked off, but they would say, enjoy your favorite song from, you know, whomever. And while you're listening to your favorite song, you know, this is our unofficial you know, education thing. We wrote schools, we wrote churches, and we really just did a ton of like a ton of like guerrilla outreach just to get people thinking about the problem. And so now here we are today. A lot of people know about the problem. A lot of people still don't know about the problem. But unfortunately, you know, we've been chasing basically I'd like to say that the industrial chocolate companies, really, the, the PR companies that they hired to thwart just a handful of grassroots activists, that money, I could have, they could have put my kids through college and stuff like that. So, you know, what's happened is the dial hasn't gone down. We've spread a lot of awareness. Other people are spreading awareness. We very much encourage other people to be activists on any kind of subject, you know, what we need to change on our planet. And although there's some interesting strides, there's legislation in not the US, but like in Canada and the EU about clean supply lines. Unfortunately, industry has also worked with these people on writing those bills. So they're quite watered down. It's going to be a while before, you know, having a clean supply line actually catches up with them. And so in the meantime, we just do whatever work we can do to keep spreading the word, creating new activists. Um, Working with, you know, helping people write legislation, helping the lawsuits that are going to the Supreme Court and such, helping with their amicus briefs. So that's what we do as a group. And, and you know, also working with, um, so you probably want to ask about the Slave Free Chocolate list, the list that we have that's very popular on our site. That would be great, yeah. Okay, do you want me to tell you how that sort of got started? So, that would be lovely. In, right, okay, in 2007, as an activist, what you want to do is you want to in, you want to inspire somebody for a call to action, right? That call to action, hopefully, is writing your legislatures, right? Working out a ban of, like, slave-tainted chocolate, maybe in your high school, maybe in your college campus. There's so many different things that one can do to spread awareness, to, to make change, but you have to be active. But one thing you can do is, you know, vote with your dollar. If you're telling people, oh, this is so horrible, we've got trafficked kids, you know, not going to school and, you know, pulling down cacao with big, huge machetes and cutting themselves. And people want to say, well, what can I do or what chocolate can I buy? So I created the ethical suppliers list back when no, there was, there was just a few handful of companies that wanted to even talk about labor with their product right it was i reached i went to talk to so many different companies they really wanted nothing to do with slavery chocolate because back then 2007 2008 2009 2010 that was it was like a pariah why why would we're you know why would we want to taint the reputation of our industry with this so i started the list of um ethical suppliers without their permission right i knew that they were doing they were operating ethically and on the first go round, there was just a few handful of, of suppliers on there. There was Divine, Eskenazi Chocolate, Theo. Uh, back then, Tony's was just starting out. Tony's was on the list back then. Green and Black's was on the list back then. And just a few others. And then as the bean to bar chocolate movement and in industry really started to grow, a lot of these companies are slave free by default. And what I mean by that is they are sourcing their cocoa from South America, which doesn't have a slavery problem. There can possibly be like there's child labor problems with every in all agriculture, but there's not a true chattel slavery problem in South America, Central America. Um, 
their farmers are in better shape than they are up here. So, and that's also the higher quality cocoa that the, you know, high end bean to bar people, people want anyway. Um, so they're, they're slave free by default. And then, so I started putting them on the list after talking to them. And now people want to be on that list because everything's flipped. People are now there. We do. Thankfully, there is enough awareness for ethical supply, not just in chocolate, but in clothes, all sorts of food, coffee beans, so many other things. People want to know that, you know, this is ethically sourced. So now, now small companies actually want to get on the list. Um, we don't charge anything for the list, but we do ask them to act as activists along with us in return. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's um, quite the quite the background and getting to this point. And um, yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I was wondering how you compiled the list. And just for folks who um, haven't seen the list, you know, again, the website is slavefreechocolate.org. Um, and there's a you know, easy link to click there, just, you know, ethical uh, what, what's the what's the tab um and ethical suppliers list ethical suppliers list right and uh, just if you look at that list i mean very conspicuously all of the really well the the very big most mainstream names are all in the you know have not uh they're not on the list they're not on the the no. good to go list unfortunately no. as you said like the hershey and nestle and cadbury and lint uh -huh. and that. um so with them just to clarify and i was wondering about this have they um kind of refuse to comment as to where they're sourcing their uh, material from or um how, how do um what what uh, what puts them on the naughty list so to speak okay what puts them on the naughty list is uh, especially those that signed the harkin indigo protocol they made a promise not just to these farmers not just to their children they made a promise to the world that they were going to clean this up all right and if our department of labor who does now through the university of chicago they do every few years these audits if the number was getting better right if there is it was if, if more of these kids like oh wow we've seen an increase in children you know enrolling in school by 15 percent i go oh the number's turning in the right direction but it hasn't it's just gotten worse for the farmers right so so even though they've jumped on board and they're isn't one single cho big chocolate company. If you go to their websites now, they never used to talk about ethics or supply chains. They didn't have to. But we as a world are moving them up to this level. Um, if you go to their websites, they all talk about how they abhor child labor. They abhor child slavery. And then they list the different um, projects that they have started, right? You know, I like, I'll just use like, I won't pick on one in particular because I can't think of exactly their little programs, but let's just say I'm making up like Acme, you know, wholesale supply, you know, chocolate. They'll have like Acme farms and this is our Acme program for our farmers. And you'll see pictures of kids in school uniforms with books under their arms and happy farmers sitting around, the, you know, sitting around a circle. So they've put a ton, a ton of money into doing that. But the one thing that they haven't done in any of this time is do the thing that's big, the, the big elephant in the room, which is pay a true, and I have to put a little asterisk around true, living wage for these farmers. Unless they make a true living wage for their work, they will not be able to afford to send their kids to school. They will not be able to afford to hire adult laborers in place of their children that are in school, right? And if some of these kids don't have, or some of these families don't have enough children, they aren't paying adult laborers. They're possibly, you know, buying traffic kits like under a tree, like chattel slavery, just like in your, like your imagination takes you. So if any of these companies were doing really the right thing, they've had 23 years now, we would see a dent in the numbers. We would see some sort of progress and we're not. So I think since we don't have any evidence that anything's getting better, we only have evidence that it's getting worse. I very clearly say that everything done to date has been for naught, has just been a PR ploy. ploy. Now, out of that, there we are coming up with, we, I mean, the planet or whatever, is coming up with some really neat technology when it comes to traceability. There's really neat technology when it comes to blockchain. These things are wonderful programs. But they're just tools. They're not an end result. Saying something's traceable just means that you can you so you can supposedly look down their supply line. But at the end of that traceability, could be a farmer 
or is a farmer making 75 cents a day and they can't afford to send their kids to school. They can't afford, you know, first aid when a child gets cut from a machete. They can't afford to take their kid to the hospital when the hospital gets sick. But that line could be possibly traceable, right? There's nothing at the end of that line that has to say, if this is traceable, it means our supply line is ethical. It just means it's traceable. Um, I'm just wondering if like your group or anyone else that you're aware of has kind of, you know, held one of these, um, one or more of these companies kind of feet to the fire saying like, yeah, you have all these pretty things on your website, but you know, these numbers really haven't changed in terms of, you know, uh, uh, child, children going to school and whatnot. I'm just, I'm wondering if anyone has, um, sort of, yeah, held their feet to the fire and if they've had any, any rebuttal to that. Yeah. I think activists and people do all the time. Okay. Hi, hi, put their feet to the fire. And they just sort of respond with there are different programs that we have going. All right. You know, saying, well, this is a complicated situation, but because we're, you know, by 20, then they move the goalposts by 20, 26, 27, we have a goal that 15% of our, you know, chocolate bars will be traceable. All right. Okay. So, okay. What's that mean? Nothing. Right. So they just kind of come back with a lot of PR. And they all, in a sense, I like to kind of call them the Coco Cartel because what it's going to take, I believe, and I don't know how this is can happen, that but the that Coco Cartel of Cargill, Olam, Barry Calibo, Mondelez, Nestle, they are all going to have to get into a room together and say, okay, we're going to start to pay a living wage. I am kind of an optimistic person. I think we, we, I like to, this might not really going off tangent, but as you know, in the United States, that corporations are sort of treated like individuals by our corporate laws. And there's a lot of complaining about that for, should be. So I thought like, okay, let's say you are a person and you get into a bunch of trouble and you get to say rock bottom trouble. All right. What do we want to do with the humanity is say, okay, you're at rock bottom or whatever you did, you know? You embezzled money for, I don't know, whatever you, whatever you did, but we want to give that person a chance. Or if you're a child, if you have any children, but if your child say they're flunking Spanish, right? Screaming at them for flunking Spanish is going to get them to pass Spanish. You have to go at some point. All right, let's work together here. I know you, I know you're getting enough in Spanish, but let's work together here together, really work together for really great decisive change. And let's just do this together. And so I think in the right circumstances, if they, we could get them around and say, we really have to pay a true living wage. And when I said there's an asterisk where the true living wage is, during right after COVID, when we had that bout of global inflation, some of these kind of like, I don't know, I don't call it, some of these kind of people who kind of have a voice in the chocolate community lowered the price of what they considered a true living wage. So X company, Acme company could say, well, we're paying half of the living wage now, but they have this. So they're still paying a quarter of a living wage, not doing anything else. So when I say a true living wage, I don't mean one that's designate, not the one they tell us is a living wage, the one that's really a living wage for those farmers right. and start there. But unless we, unless we get to have that done, everything else we're doing might be spreading awareness, but it's not going to, it's not going to incite change. Um, and, and just circling back to something you said earlier, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but where if some of these larger companies have said, oh, by, you know, 2027 or 2030 or whatever, like 50% of our chocolate products will be traceable or whatnot. So um, to my, if I'm, you know, just putting on my logic cap here, like that uh, does suggest that they're kind of tacitly admitting that um, a significant portion of their chocolate currently is not um entirely ethically produced and if they're setting the goal of like 50 percent down the road um like then even at that point half of it would still be not ethically yeah. produced is that a is that a right. fair extrapolation or that's, a, yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly what's going on that's exactly what's going on you know so and i like to use the term brand washing right so you know everything is everything they do they need and you have to say what is a ceo's number one priority right is to produce profit for that company Right. So I think, you know, we're sort of a little bit at odds. I think that the stuff that would have to change, it will, they'll have to say, and I don't even think it's going to really to pay a living wage way down the pipeline. I, it's not going to like bust any of these companies, but they're going to have to tell their shareholders, we're actually making decisive changes to end child labor in our industry. Right. And it just, the, you know, there's chattel slavery with the chocolate, but then when you look at a chocolate bar, then we're, let's look at the sugar, right? 
let's look at you know what i mean let's look at some of the other ingredients that go into the chocolate bar um there could be issues with them too but I, you know i believe that chocolate and the reason that i sort of sort of pick chocolate is you know there's currently there's more people held in modern day slavery on this planet than have ever been collected together all right and that's because of the the population right there's problems with sex trafficking there's problems with the yogurts in china there's problems with bricks in nepal there's, you know, the 3.6 million children on this planet are not going to school because their farmer parents can't afford to send them to school. All right. If we can take one thing, one thing and say, let's, let's do chocolate because nobody really needs chocolate. It's a consumer product, right? I'm never going to buy bricks that are coming out of Nepal or rubber that's coming out of Ghana. So I'm, st I'm, I'm too far away. I'm not, a, I'm not associated at all with that supply chain. But I am with chocolate, all right? And chocolate is a treat. Chocolate is something people love. Some people are chocoholics. Some people use it for medicine purposes. All this stuff is great. I really believe that we have the power as, as consumers to get this done. And if the industry could say, okay, if we could tackle the, the problem with the, the kids in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, if we, if we could handle this problem, I think it would set up a model to then be able to go on and say, okay, world, we're now paying a little bit more for chocolate because we want a clean supply line, a truly clean supply line. One that is also independently verified. Right now, there isn't anything that's independently verified, all right? Like if I'm a chocolate company and I hire KPMG to do an audit on me, well, I'm paying KPMG to do an audit on me. They're going to be probably as nice as they can so they get the contract next year, right? We have no 100%, you know, independent verification on, on, on any food product. And then when we look at all the stuff down the line, sustainability, indigenous rights, um, environmental problems, all the stuff, nothing's getting better. But we do a lot of talk about it. We have a lot of talk about it. We just haven't really plugged it into the to real life yet. Um, I would like to um, just eventually segue into talking about uh, kind of simple things that folks can do in their day to day lives to you know help around this issue. And I think one of the simple steps would be just buy from companies that are um, ethically sourcing their their uh, materials. Uh, just before we get into that, though, um, and I'm just wondering, uh, just kind of a little slightly tangential question here, but I'm just wondering how does uh, if you happen to know because um, I. I Paraphrasing something I think you said earlier, where uh, really a lot of food production has a, um, you know, say workers that aren't getting paid enough. Maybe there's, you know, child, um, uh, you know, ex exploitation or involvement, um, you know, young kids working on farms or whatnot in other food industries, too. I'm just wondering if you have a sense of how, like, the chocolate industry kind of um, ultimately um, inflicting, you know, um, uh, slave like conditions or slave labor conditions um, would compare to other industries, like say growing, you know, bananas or avocados or other, other thing, coffee beans. Like I know there's lots of uh, free trade coffee or, or maybe ethically sourced coffee nowadays, but just wondering if you could contrast that to any other food uh, stuffs that we might be familiar with. Yes. I think pretty much when you, when you look at any commodity, it's bad news, right? Maybe not, you know, maybe, maybe hopefully cocoa, is the only one where there's actual chattel slavery, where they're actually pulling kids and out of these other countries and making them work on these farms. I hope so. But we have what, 3.2, 3.6 million children around the planet, whether it's coffee, sugar, um, you know, I guess you name it, there's a problem with child labor in it. And the one thing that was, is supposed to help, and it's been a real mixed bag, is fair trade. When somebody asks me, like, well, what kind of bar should I buy? You know, what 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 can I what can we prove? Well, if, if you the fair trade label, when it first when I first started slavery chocolate, fair trade hadn't really moved, hadn't really made a voice in the in the world of cocoa. All right. When it started to say, when some of these companies started to say, okay, well, we're going to start to implement some fair trade farms, right? Fair trade is a great idea because you get paid more for your product, you get paid more for your commodity, and that money goes into, say, maybe helps with you know, education for best practices for sustainability, or maybe best practices for we should be using this kind of natural fertilizer or you know weed killer or whatever. It's a great ideal, but it's not a big enough 
umbrella to get kids that were trafficked back home across our country. It's, it's not a policing force, right? It's an idea to help farmers out. And when it comes to cacao, a lot of these big, big ones are really the product or brainchild of a bigger complicit multinational like Rainforest Alliance, I think it belongs sort of to Nestle. Um, all these other things are kind of been, they're kind of acting like sort of like a beard in the same sense. And so when it comes to fair trade, if you go onto these farms for the for the big ones, they're finding all sorts of child labor on them, right? Be, but because fair trade isn't supposed to be that. Fair trade, I think, would be a great program implemented once everybody's making a uh, a true a true fair wage for their for their work then we put um then i think fair trade can really shine but it, it doesn't it's not a policing thing it's not you know round up some money for kids to go to school right and then that said there are some great fair trade cooperatives small ones that are working out really 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 well for their farmers but it just there's just not enough of them to turn down the dial in child labor Enough of them working correctly to turn down the child the the dial in child labor is the problem. Um, are there any other groups that are similar to yours that are out there? Like, are are you is your website one of a kind, or are there groups in other countries yeah, or other areas? I think so. I think we were, I think we were the um, we for sure we're the first. Okay, we're the first to say we're not child labor, or, you know, international rights and stuff like that. We were the first say website or website program just to focus on chocolate that's for sure hopefully there's a lot more out there because part of our work is to spurn other activists you know our work is going to reach a certain audience but if there's somebody in japan that has a site like ours that's really wonderful they can reach an audience that we can't communicate very, with very easily you know the same in europe the same in south america so i'm hoping and i think there's probably lots and lots and lots of like little tiny satellite things. And their work is really important too, as what they do on social media or this or that, they're gathering more things. Now, the the bigger groups that are working on this issue, one is international rights advocates. Those are the lawyers in Washington, D.C. that are doing the lawsuits. They work in conjunction with corporate accountability corporate accountability labs in Chicago. And they're the ones who are really doing the very, very important lawsuits, right? So they're, they're, they're working in, on that over there. There's tons of technologies that like the, you know, blockchain technologies and the trans things, all, all of those people have good interests at heart as well, you know, but the big elephant in the room is paying the farmers a living wage and they're not they haven't had a price increase in their beans like since like the 1980s wow that is a very long time that's a very long time every everything's going up except for that um so and in terms of um simple steps that you know just anyone listening to this interview could take to you know sort of help remedy this problem so i'm going to ask you about simple steps and then maybe more involved steps so oh, um, okay great um because on our on our website um we have a little compilation from every interview like you know simple steps that can be taken to help with the problem at hand and then some more involved steps as well um so i'm, I'm assuming the simplest step is you know reference your list if you're going to buy chocolate buy it from the the, the from our the list nice, or the nice or, list yeah. Or not yeah, the from a nice list. So yeah. our list isn't the only slavery chocolate companies. There's many, many, many small bean to bar companies out there. And we just don't have the resources, the bandwidth to chase down all of these people to advertise for them for free, right? That's not what we're about. We're about action, right? So we wait for these companies to come to us mm -hmm. or for somebody who said, oh, I'm buying, you know, you know, some really wonderful chocolate in, you know, my hometown of Detroit. They say they source all their beans from, you know, Peru, all that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of times a consumer will write in and say, can you look into, you know, Junior's chocolate company? And I don't believe in this situation. I really don't believe that certification all right, it, it's going to work at this point with these small chocolate companies because usually certification, unless we have something bigger that's independently verified, you know, Safe Free Chocolate does not offer a certificate because how do we know? And then how do we know? Like, so I go visit, 
I'll, I'll just use this thing because they're good friends of mine. Indie Chocolate in Seattle, right? They work ethically, but I could go have a meeting with Erin in, you know, Indie Chocolate. She tells me the, the farms that she buys from in like Venezuela or Peru or wherever she buys from. And, you know, I say, oh, wow, it looks like you've got a clean slate here. And here's your, our certificate, you know, but you have to pay for all this. Who's paying for it? The, are the farmers paying for it? Are these small chocolatiers paying for it? And it's really just a label. So what, then they pay me to do that. When then the next day after I leave their facility, they could buy coverture from one of the bad guys. And how do you even know, right? So it's, to me, it's set, certification isn't the answer unless we can get a global certification that that's independently verified. That's like a different story. Um, but if you look at where the, the cocoa is sourced, right? If it has a fair trade label, some of these fair trade People are kind of wishy-washy on their ethics, but the big chocolate companies, they do know how many bars are purchased that are fair trade. They do keep those statistics. I'm positive that they do, right? So maybe you're not real sure, but you see a fair trade label on something. I would say go ahead and buy that before not buying anything, right? Or you can't find something on, on a list because that will at least tell um, the big companies that they're buying a, a fair trade product. Another simple thing can, you can do, and on our website, slavefreechocolate.org, are all the email addresses to the customer service sites of all the big, complicit companies. I don't think that they can get too many little emails saying, you know, what are you doing about the fact that child labor is not decreasing in your supply chain, all right? And you'll get back you know, some canned PR response that they abhor child labor and they're doing everything they can, but at least that they're getting and they can't be inundated with too many of those emails. All right. Another thing that we can do, and this is sort of a tough one, but we can do it. I've done it is the depart the U S department of um, um, customs and border patrol, border protection. Sorry. I keep calling patrol I'm from California customs and border protection. Um, they, by law, are not allowed to bring in through customs products that are tainted with slavery and, and the worst forms of child labor. They're not allowed to do that. They've stopped a few things. They stopped some gloves coming in. I think it was from Indonesia, like hospital, like nitrile gloves or something like that, because it turned out it was made with horse or slave labor. They have done that. By law, they're not supposed to do that. But the people like us and other people who've been campaigning, they like, why do you still let the cacao in from Ivory Coast when it's listed in the Department of Labor's list that this is a product made with child slavery? The U.S. government cannot purchase cacao from the Ivory Coast. But the U.S. government, federal government, doesn't have a Willy Wonka chocolate factory making anything, right? They can purchase the derivative products, which would be like M&M's. Right, but they have that list, so we know it's it's no question that it's a, a slave tainted product, right? But you know who knows who is talking to the Customs and Border Patrol, and there's a lawsuit against them. People can just go in and write in, ask for a case number. It takes a while, but you ask for a case number and say, "I want an explanation for this," and they come back and they say, "Well, they didn't really prove it, or this letter is too old, or this or that." But they just have a ton of excuses and something they should be they should be embargoing. 100% and they're not. So go after, you know, those kind of people. Write your write your your public officials, right? Um also just knowing as consumers whenever we're purchasing um you know, whether it's clothes or chocolate or you know, any of these items, you know, always sit there and go, well, at least I know like what are the ethics? What what is the supply chain? What is this tied into? If you're getting something really cheap that's a good time to scratch your head right you know like um oh valentine's day comes and goes the u.s sells more chocolate each year you know than it had the year before and most of that cheap chocolate and the the boxes and everything 100 percent tied tied to child labor right maybe stop and do something different you know when you're doing that instead buy a really nice lovely healthier you know, dark chocolate or something from one of these lists that sell their beautiful bars, but they can't afford to make a box of a cheap box of chocolates and compete with the industrial players. 
And so, so getting on to these companies and supporting these companies, also understand that these companies who are doing everything ethically are going against people who are lying about doing everything ethically. So on the surface, it looks like an even playing field, but it absolutely is not. Um, just for folks who have like just never thought about this topic prior to the, um, you know, hearing this uh, interview, um, so would it be a, a fair general rule that pretty much anything, say at the standard grocery store checkout or at the convenience store front counter, like are you going to find any chocolate products that are on the the nice list, or is it all going to be naughty list chocolate as a rule? Well, unless you go to like a you know specialty like a Whole Foods like health right. if you go section to, or something, right? If you go to Whole Foods, they have like an ethical chocolate section. Not there's some brands on there that i have a, a beef with but basically those would be them you can go to our list you can look on a package fair trade eh, fair trade eh, but at least at least it's um a data point for them if you buy a fair trade bar also too if if one thing that you never see on all the child the slave child chocolate is you never see where it's sourced from right they don't say source from ghana Source from Ivory Coast, they say Swiss chocolate, okay? But that's all bad, right? The Swiss chocolate's all bad, but they don't say where it's sourced from. Like if I buy a bottle of wine at Trader Joe's, I know, oh, this was sourced in Italy, right? Or this was sourced in Napa Valley. They have to say that on the label, the chocolate bars don't. But the companies that are behaving ethically are paying more all the way down the line, okay? They're paying more for everything. They don't have any big company partnering with them to help them. They will say where that cacao comes from on their bar because they want you to know that you're buying a better product. So they'll say like, this is 70% Peruvian cocoa. So there is your, there is your sign that that's ethically sourced. That's really handy. Yep. That's a good, good uh, frame of reference. All right. Organic is one too. Organic isn't a bad one too, because in order to be an organic farm, you have to be, you have to be able to read and write and write forms and send in forms and do all this other kind of work that a farmer that's making seventy five cents a day isn't able to do. So organic isn't a bad a bad way to go either. Okay, in a note here. Um. And I know you've obviously been steeped in this for for many years now. Um, I've I've asked you the questions that I kind of had burning in my mind because uh, as right. I told you um, before we started chatting, I've had this uh, kind of topic on my radar for about ten years now or so. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, are there any questions that um, I, I should have asked? Slash, is there anything else like that you'd like to share with listeners that we haven't touched on that's that's uh, important? Nothing. I I think we've pretty covered it all, and I just like to emphasize that um, anything you do that's in action. It's going to help a little bit, right? It's going to spread awareness, right? Thumbs liking something on a Facebook post or whatever, maybe shows your sentiment, but that's not true action. True action is picking up the phone. True action is, you know, writing an email. True action is, you know, there's some great documentaries out there. If you have people have school projects and they want to show any of the dark side of chocolate um, documentaries done by Mickey Mizrati. You know, that that is true, what I could consider to be true, true action. You know, if you have time and you want to pick on one of these big Kartaka companies like Hershey's and say, why is there child labor? And they'll come back. No, it's not. You know, pull the thread on them, like write them back. Well, can you prove that? Like, you know, what are you doing? Let, let me lay it out. Right. And then we know that if the if they weren't lying, any of those big companies, if any of those big companies were doing the right thing 100 percent through, then the number would go down because there's only like eight of them. Right. So if we'd see an eighth in, you know, the numbers getting better, but we're not, we're seeing everything go up. So I think anything you can do and just realize too, that I think as a planet and humanity, we have to get off on a mindset that we deserve everything to be cheap as possible. There's a price that we pay for, you know, buying that $4 box heart of, you know, chocolate, right. That $1 t-shirt, you know, that's probably going to end up in a landfill someplace you know just to be cognizant of that i think that collective consciousness of us knowing that you know everything everything has a cost to it whether you're if you're saving money somebody might be suffering on the end of it with everything not just chocolate 
that's really well said. And <clears throat> I wish they would teach us that in school when we were kids growing up, because it's just, yeah, something I, I don't think many industries want us to know about that. No, they don't. No, they fast don't. Fast food, no. fast fashion, fast chocolate, right, whatever. Exactly. Fast chocolate, fast chocolate. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, we need that. Uh, you need to kind of take that ownership, like with our, our uh, buying power. And um, yeah, I think that's really, really well said. And yeah. Um, well, uh, and just as we're wrapping up here, um, I'm just uh, wondering if folks, uh, like we've already mentioned the website a few times, you know, slavefreechocolate.org. I'll post that in the show notes. Um, are there uh, social media platforms that you folks are on? Yeah, um, we have a page on Facebook, Slave Free Chocolate on Facebook. Interestingly, because of the power of these big complicit companies, Facebook has pretty much sort of shut us down. We were doing this really great campaign where we would take an ethical chocolate company. They would send in $60, right? So give me $60. I would make an ad that targeted their, like if they're in Detroit, right? Or whatever, Indie Chocolate in Seattle. I would put the audience as a Seattle audience, right? And it says Indie Chocolate supports slavery chocolate. When they hit the link, it would go to our site, but they would learn about this and see that India... Indie Chalk was a partner of this. That was going that was going along really well until, you know, obviously sixty dollars here, sixty dollars there doesn't compete with the advertising that these big complicit companies do. And so Facebook's algorithm got wind of that and really kind of squat quash us from pushing anything out. Even though we're hundred percent ethical, we're not we're not violating any of their rules or anything like that. Everything we have is 100% verified from the Department of Labor. So there's a Facebook page. There's a um, uh, Instagram page, slave feed chocolate underscore org. Um, but, you know, I encourage people to, you know, try starting a TikTok, TikTok channel, anything like that it spreads a little awareness. I know a lot of this stuff gets, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of place, easy ways to squash it from their big advertisers. But for a while, you can get some going for a while. You can, you know, get an audience going. So there's that as well. And then basically the site, um, there's lots of things to do on the site. We post new things that are coming up as far as information. If you're a um, student of any type and you want to write about this subject, that's awesome. Because when you write about it, the rest of your class knows, and lots of people know that there's tons of resources on that site that you can use for your research. That's great. Yeah, yeah, that's very handy. <clears throat> Great. Well, um, again, I'll put every uh, links to everything in the show notes um, uh, with the podcast episode. We'll post it on YouTube as well. It'll be in the description below the video. Um, and thanks so much for your time today. Thanks for all the work that you've done over the years. It's a really oh, amazing welcome. project. And yeah, I'm just really thankful for groups like yours to spread this awareness. And yeah, it's made a positive impact in my life. And I tell people about it. And, and now we're going to tell even more people about it. So thank you so okay, much wonderful. for your time. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Okay. And uh, okay. th thanks everyone okay. for uh, okay. tuning into this episode of the okay. Uh, optimistic future podcast uh, please stay tuned for the next one okay great